Hi, it's a pleasure to be here in my hometown. The last, how long we lived here, James? Since 91, so by golly, we're almost long enough to become true citizens of Gallatin here. But we're glad to be here tonight. I'm hoping to show and share a little bit about my work, but also what goes into historical painters' work and my models. It's going to be a big portion of my presentation tonight devoted to my models of whom Several of them are here in the background, and I think it'd be interesting for you to know what they do to make me look better than they do for all of them. I'm going to be in the back talking, and I'll talk as loud as I can, but if you can't hear me, or if I get down too low, just raise your hand, and I'll talk a little bit more. So, so I'll go ahead and start. I'm going to tell you about my life, and Booth Western Art Museum told me Recently, when I gave a presentation at our house a couple weeks ago to some collectors, he said, just tell them three things. Tell them about your early life, tell them what you do and how you do it, and then get off the stage. You know? <laughs> well, pictures worth a thousand words. We've already heard that before. And so I'm going to show you pictures and talk very little. But I'll talk along with it, and we'll make this thing go through as quickly as we can. But I'm glad to be here, glad that you all are here. So let's get it started. Okay, there we go. First thing we encounter is the well, machine doesn't work. <laughs> okay, there you go. I'm an artist, I'm not a mechanic, so I always have to have help. But the early years of my painting. Just to prove that I didn't come out from under a rock, I brought a few slides here to show my early life and the fact that I was born in Rosine, Kentucky. Small town in the northwest of Bowling Green. This is the house I was born in, my grandfather's farm, and my brothers and I lived there and grew up there as youngsters. Don is my older brother, who you all know, know Don, previous mayor of Gallatin and state senator who lives here, and my older brother, Joe, who passed away earlier this year. But we grew up in that farm part of the time. And one thing about Rosine that <clears throat> everybody knows about that knows bluegrass music is that Bill Monroe was born there. I wasn't the only person to note that was born there, but Bill Monroe was. That's Bill in the second from the right in the back uh, line there. But also in that picture is my father standing next to him who played with him. They grew up together and played music together as youngsters. And my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my brother, my oldest brother, several uh, uncles and cousins are all in that picture. And that photograph was made at that house I just showed in about 1940. <coughs> so as a youngster, and that's me as a little bitty, little bitty child over there on the right. But uh, <coughs> that's Rosie. That's the way it looked in 1946, I would say, maybe sometime around that. At that time, it was a roaring little town. It had seven general stores, post office, uh, blacksmith shop, food feed store, and the barber shop. Today, all it's got left is a post office. And a barn. And a barn. And a barn. Yeah, it does have a barn. But the wagons and the mules and the horses are all my grandfather traveled with, and that's what we grew up with. He never learned to drive. He never had a vehicle. That's the oldest known painting that I've still got in existence, and that was our dog that I painted about when I was 14 years old, that named Mike. So I wanted to show you that, show you I'm 14 years old, so we're talking, what, 1956 or so there, before I got out of high school. Now about that same time, and here's where the, the history part of growing up enters into my life, it changes the direction of well, what my real interest was at the time. I've always been interested in history, even as a child, but in 1954, David Crockett came on market with Walt Disney. And everybody our age, at that age of 14, 15 years old, became enamored with the life of David Crockett and frontier history. Now, fast forward to 2000, right about 2000, and I had a painting in a museum opening in Texas and the title of the, of the exhibit was the uh, Sunrise in My Pocket, The Life of David Crockett. Now, do you recognize that fellow standing there with me? That's Parker. That's Parker. 
So I had a great chance to meet him. I had my picture made. I was standing in a hole, really. Uh, <laughs> but he's a big fella, I'll tell you what. Nice guy. And the unique thing about Fess Parker in 2000, 44 years later, 46 years after Davy Crockett came out, was the people that paid $150 a ticket to come to that opening that night to meet him went out the building and around the building just to get an autograph. And they're all our age. So he had a lot of rich Texans down there to see him, and he never got through signing all of the autographs that they wanted to. But he met him as really a fine gentleman, very much so to me. Here we go back to our, our Civil War interest when I was a youngster. Growing up in Tennessee, you can't get far away from Civil War history at all. And uh, I was a little Confederate. There was a book out on it, uh, written back in those years called Little Confederate, and I figured I was. Don and I did this painting together, what, Don, about 1956, maybe? Yeah. And uh, it shows all of the, the gore and the blood and mayhem that went into Civil War battles that we thought at the time. But it established our interest in American history as far as the Civil War goes, and it still continued to this day. Now, in 1960, when I got out of high school, I went to art school. I only have a few drawings that I did during art school, so there's not much here, just to show you kind of things. Here's a painting I did right at that time, oh, about a year or two after I got out of art school, but I like to paint horses. That's one I did uh, in oil. And then, when in 1962, after some study in Europe, I entered into the art market career at the Newspaper Printing Corporation, which is the local newspaper in Nashville, the Banner and the Tennessee and together had an art department and I became an artist and one of the artists that uh, worked there. This is a painting I did in 1963, uh, right before the uh, Civil War Centennial. Well, the Civil War Centennial had been going on since 61, but before the 1964 uh, publication on the Battle of Franklin came out, and this is the death of uh, General Adams, uh, one of my first full Civil War paintings I ever did. And here again, you can see all of the mayhem and things that go on at that time in my life doing Civil War paintings. But 64, I got drafted, went in the Army, went to Fort Gordon, volunteered, went to Vietnam, and served a year over there. Came back at the end of 65. But while I was over there, well, okay. Did a little door gun in a helicopter, too. But while I was over there, too, I managed to do some drawings and some paintings, not a lot, about 30 altogether, whenever I could find some paints and some pencils and some ink. And these are just a few of the drawings that showed you what I was doing at that time. But I came back to real life, went back to work, the newspaper, and within a year, I had uh, resigned the newspaper and went to work in the ad agency, and within two years, started our own group of artists and illustrators called Studio Six. Now the interesting thing about that photograph there is if you knew the people that were in it, the fellow on the left is Ralph McDonald. Ralph, of course, we all know who Ralph McDonald is here in Gallatin. Well, Ralph was my figure instructor in art school. And then went together with the other fellows there, uh, two of them are still, three of them are still artists. The others have all retired. But uh, I'm in the upper right in the back. The neat thing about that picture was I think there were 13 guns in it, maybe more. Than we all had. <laughs> but we were Viva Six, you know, the, the outlaws of the art world in that, uh, that time. And I did design and I did illustration as well. But all the time I did that, I painted. Still painted to design artwork. Was a designer and an illustrator about 17 years. I really phased it out in the mid 70s when I started painting full time. But I did landscapes back then, primarily. Still did some frontier work, but landscapes was my forte. And there's just a couple landscapes that I did. You can see the deer in that one there, right down there in the, in the uh, brush. That's the creek behind mine and Jane's house. Um, that's a, about what, 19, about 2000, somewhere painted around there. We live on Asher's Creek, which is, uh, which is out by the airport. And uh, it's one of the last landscapes I've actually painted because, here we go, what do I do, touch that? 
It stopped on me. Okay. Is that it? There we go. It's freezing on my painting there. Okay. Got to have my tech advisor come in. Okay, we got it. It's moved. All right, let's see. Let me back up there. Okay, moving forward. Also a landscape, still life, I guess you could call that, of a, called the squatters. Uh, and that's actually an elk, uh, set of elk antlers we got on our barn and the uh, sparrows nest in it every year. <laughs> so I caught them. My first break, I guess you'd say, in the art world really came because all the shows I was doing were local and uh, local shows in the 70s didn't bring in a lot of money. But starting in 1973, Greystone Press was formed and produced limited edition prints. And uh, I was one of the first artists that went with them. And this is one of my landscapes that was produced at that time. It did limited edition paper prints <clears throat> back in that time and signed and numbered. And when you framed them, you had to frame them under glass with a mat, make them look right. This is called uh, Reawakening. And that's over in the Smoky Mountains, that barn is, which burned down not too long after I painted it. <clears throat> and that was my first full color frontier print that I did at that time. That was done in 1978. So by five years, 77, 78, I was starting into frontier work. So this is called the uh, way of life. And at that time, my direction turned from landscapes into producing more American frontier paintings. And that's where I'm going there. This was another uh, career changer for me. This painting I did in 1982 called Up the South Slope was purchased by a collector in Georgia who eventually started the Booth Western Art Museum about 2009 or 10. And he put this painting of mine in that collection and built, when he built the museum, this painting is on exhibit at the uh, museum. They now own five of my paintings, but that was the first one that uh, had sold in Texas at an auction. How then. big is that? It was about 38 inches wide, if I remember right. And that's the Booth Western Art Museum in Carterville, Georgia. If you ever have an opportunity on your way to Atlanta, that's two miles off the interstate at Carterville, Georgia. If you have an interest in Civil War art and Western art, I highly recommend you pull off and go over there to it. It's a world-class museum, Smithsonian affiliated. Got some wonderful artwork, primarily uh, contemporary work, though there is some uh, antique deceased artist work in the museum too. They also have traveling exhibits of Indian artifacts, uh, good Civil War exhibit too, of you know, paintings. And here's another early painting I did of the Western Fur Trade. I focused on the Western Fur Trade and the American Frontier Eastern Long Hunter time period. I'm not a military painter. I paint the people rather than an event, wouldn't you? I, talk about being a historical painter. I paint history, I paint people, I paint uh, the stories that go along with them. Now, historical painter marches to a different drum than landscape artists and other painters who paint still lives and so forth, because we do not have in front of us <coughs> our subject. We have to make our subject up. We have to come up with a story, a reason, a purpose, and then we have to come up with the actual visuals, excuse me, of what goes into that. Now that's where research comes into, <clears throat> into play, and I, as well as other artists that I know do historical paintings, are always researching, always do. And that's a place where it's, I don't have frontiersmen, long hunters, mountain men running around in front of me. I have to, let's say I have to put together the people who model for me. And then later on tonight, I'm going to get into my model uh, group here and explain to you what encompasses all of that. So good models make an artist's work much better. This is called Lure of the Mountains. <clears throat> I'm always drawn back to those mountains. I go out to the Rockies as often as I can. I belong to American Mountain Men, and we rode, do rides of the 1820s and 30s, that time period dressed carrying the gear and the accoutrements, 
back in those Rocky Mountains. And I've done that since the 80s. Still try to do it when I can, though it's getting a little bit harder to get on a horse nowadays. So I need smaller horses or I need a lift, one of the two. We won't get into the Cumberland Gap ride tonight where I fell off. But I'm still here and I'm still hitting for the fence. But these show you what I'm talking about when we do a brigade of mountain men recreating the 1820s and 30s in those Rocky Mountains, which has changed very, very little from the back when they were there. You get back in the wilderness areas there and you're back to 1820 real quick. I love it, enjoy doing it. It's quite a challenge. I'll say this, that we've had quite a few men hurt through the years. You're dealing with an animal that's got a brain on size of something. I'm never sure of it, but he outweighs me by six times and I'm trying to make him think I'm in charge. Now one way I get a lot of the background and the, I guess the research interest in history and what I do is I take part in it like I was talking about and get out there and get on the ground and recreate the time period. Now this is 1775, 1780 time period, so we're recreating long hunter period just as it is and was here in 1780s when Bledsoe and Mansker and Robertson and all of them came in here. That's the time period we're portraying there. That's at the end of a nine day survival trek that we did without any food, without any salt, took nothing at all and had to live off the land for nine days. We did. I lost 12 pounds, but I <laughs> got through it. And it was a, it's an interesting challenge to find out what happens to you when you walk out of 19, then 1983 and into 1775 and your body's not ready for it. Believe me, and I thought I prepped for it really well before the trip, but I found out afterwards I should have took another two or three weeks of not eating very much, get my body prepared for it. This is back out west again, uh, showing me 1992, I think it was, on one of the rides. We'd just come out of those mountains behind you, which is the Uinta Mountains, up into this area, this, this high desert, they call it, but the interesting thing about that, and that's where I was going, is that field, that meadow below me is the site of the original 1825 rendezvous, fur trade rendezvous, one of the first ones that uh, started down there, and we went down into that to a rendezvous. So we did about, a, I don't know, six or eight days of riding. What state? Utah. Wyoming and Utah. That would be in Wyoming right there. The mountains are in Utah. It's right there on that line. And this just shows some of the challenges, you know, that we did from time to time. That was a 40-mile day. Believe me, that's a long way across there. If you look real close, you'll see several of those guys are asleep. And their horses are asleep, too, I believe. There you go from, and I'm still doing it today. This is me and Jeremiah last year at Cumberland Gap. We did a ride across the Cumberland Gap with about oh, 13 other riders. And that was a neat recreation because... 1770s, Daniel Boone came across the Cumberland Gap as did another large contingent of people later on, but my painting of Daniel Boone coming through the Cumberland Gap in 1775, which you'll see a little bit later on, getting into that same wilderness road occasion that he and his, and all of the people who came through the Cumberland Gap was a really interesting and rewarding experience. Jeremiah now is 17, he, we just did a ride about a month ago up at Blue Licks Battlefield in Kentucky, and he's very interested in history, and I'm glad of it. This is a Henry's Fort Grange of uh, that place that I told you where 1825 rendezvous took place. I did this painting after one of the rides out there. We move back into the east. These are long hunters, 1770s, 1760s time period, uh, called the fall of the probably if I remember the cool gray dog fog of dawn, is that what it is, Jane? I need Jane to help me remember my titles. But it shows basically the same thing just in an earlier time period. You're on horseback, you've got pack horses. They were here to hunt the deer. They uh, sent deer hides back east, which got sent to England, and that was a big trade in the uh, 1760s and 70s. They were named long hunters for the time period that they stayed away from home accordingly and we had them right here. This is called, uh, oh boy, help me, help me Jason, moment away. Uh, this one has three models in it that uh, live right here in Gallatin. 
Uh, it's a waterfall that's over in East Tennessee called Ball River Falls, but the moment away suggests something in a moment's going to happen. And you can't really tell right here now, but those three figures above the falls are Indians, and the two figures below are hunters. And neither know that the other ones are there. So if the Indians get far enough to the edge of that falls, and the hunters can't hear anything because boy, it roars, of course, then they're at a disadvantage, and a moment away something might happen. But we're just going to have to take our imaginations to come up with what it may be. My models for that, as I mentioned, are Aaron Eeler, Jason Gatliff, and Mike Copeland. And uh, that was a real popular painting at the Idle George show a couple years ago. Okay, we're flipping back out west. Here's a typical beaver trapper. This is at Ben's Fort in uh, Colorado. That's Mike Agee, who's in the room with me, who's been one of my models for a long, long time, too. Good model. And he is a fur tra trader, and it's titled Waiting for His Fur Tally. Ben Sports, a really great restoration or recreation, I guess you say, of a 1830s frontier fort on the western frontier. Here's another western painter coming into a fort in the wintertime. Some more of the, of the large, I like to paint the large landscape of the far west. That's one thing that you can really get into and feel the expanse of all of that country out there, which here, with our closeness of trees, our mountains are not as expansive as that. So you have a completely different feel when you get out there and try to portray that. And this one, of course, is the hugeness of the mountains behind and coming down on the smallness of human mankind below the Indian woman standing in front of her teepee and a, a man coming back in with a deer on the horse. This painting is a Lewis and Clark called Lewis and Clark Decision of Mariah's River. It's a, a very historic moment in the Lewis and Clark expedition, exposition, expedition in 1805. Mariah's River is on the left, the, the uh, Missouri is on the right, but they came to that location and not didn't know which river to take. They couldn't tell which river was going to go, they hoped, to the Western Ocean. Even neither one did, of course, but they uh, stayed there a week and uh, went up the Marias River and went up the Missouri River and came back down and after the conclusion of all of the uh, people involved, went up the Wright River, which was the Missouri River. Had they gone up the Marias River, our history would be changed because they would never made it across the mountains to the Western Ocean. So that painting there is uh, got 13 of the 29 or 28 men that was actually on the exposition. This is another fur trapper. These are traders looking out over beaver creeks. This is the painting that was mentioned earlier called Uninvited Visitors. <clears throat> I did this one for the first show, first entry into the Idle Jor Quest for the West show. And uh, the museum purchases, they purchase one painting every year for the permanent collection, and they purchase this one. The interesting thing about this one is it's right here in Gallatin. That tree, that sycamore tree, stood right outside of Gallatin on Highway 231, 31E. And uh, it's gone now. It uh, died, and they bulldozed it down, built a house there. And actually, the tree is much bigger than I painted it. But when I started this painting and had the tree the actual size, it overwhelmed the figures. And of course, the, the mystery of this is these Indians are coming in, and you don't know whether they're friendly or not. And so, of course, both men have their rifles at ready if they turn out to be unfriendly. But the one thing to look for here is the horse on the background is looking beyond the Indians. So what's behind them? Is there another two, five, or ten Indians out there too? We won't know at this point whether it's not what that's the case. There's a close-up of it. Is There's that, the actual tree. Is that the tree that uh, Bigfoot Spencer stayed in? No, it isn't at all. Bigfoot Spencer's tree is located out in, uh, on Wynwood property. Yeah. This tree, though, According to Ralph Earl, who measured when the, the remains of Bigfoot Spencer's tree in 1823 was 12 foot in diameter, this tree is 12 foot in diameter too. I've been in it, I've built fires in it, I've never slept in it, but you could, it's how big it is. 
and there's the painting and uh, that to show with the ward. Indians, I do Western Indians and I do Woodland Indians. And this is a, a Mandan Indian, the other one was a Shawnee. I paint Indian women and uh, lots of fun stuff to get into when you're painting historical subjects um, and try to do them as accurately as you can. A lot of research is demanded and to do one, to try to do it accurately demands that you do research and you do not use the movies for your reference at all. <laughs> this is an actual portrait of Anawaki Clanch who was Cherokee and uh, she stressed in 1770s, 1780s uh, clothing there. And I was very fortunate to get picked up on a viral internet email that went out and you can see how part of my painting made that thing happen. <laughs> so you never know where your work's going to show up next, you know. I don't think Elizabeth Warren is quite as pretty as our walking plant. <laughs> Another great love of mine is canoeing, and especially birch bark canoeing. And I own a birch bark canoe, and when I can, I put it in the water <laughs> and use it, which is not as often down here. So, 1995, I believe it was, I got that canoe, and Larry Spizak and I went to the Boundary Waters and put it in and canoed a week up there. And here again, this is all part of my lesson to learn how do you do these things to make them look right and by going out there and wearing the clothing that they wore and riding the horses that they ro rode horses like they rode and getting in those mountains give me a little bit of an insight what those people went through we can't recreate that time period obviously lots of reasons why there's not hostiles out there to get you there's bears out there i found that out real close <laughs> but also, in the back of your mind, you know you're coming back to a 21st century environment. And so you can't completely take yourself away from it. Though when I've done these weeks by myself, after a while, you can really start slipping backwards mentally, even though you know you're still going to come back to civilization. That was a great trip, but it also allowed me to do some paintings of canoes. This is a moose hunt I did two weeks up in Canada with the fellow in the back. Now this painting here has got local roots again because it originated right here with, with local models. This is called, what is this one yeah. called? Yeah. Captives. Captives, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I need a script here in front of me on <laughs> the title. But the way I put this painting together mentally, for a long time I wanted to do a captive painting. My wife's ancestor was captured by the Creeks or the, the Cherokees wound up with the Creeks right out here at Ziegler Station, 1793 or 4? 92. And she was taken off for three years and kept as captives down there. Well, they, she did come back. They, got, they ransomed her back in three years, so she got back home. This painting depicts a northern venue with birch bark canoes, and it's probably the most symbolic painting that I've ever done, and I'll explain to you why. You've got Indian, two Indians who are the capturers, and then you've got two captives in the middle of it, a woman and a man, white people, and they're very white, and the Indians are very tan, obviously, reasons why. And that contrast between the victors and the vanquished there, you know, of who they are, kind of stands out. But also above him is a black streak coming down. You see it coming down the middle there, right over him? More than likely, based on past history, she probably would have been made a slave or adopted. He would have probably been burned at the stake. That was his likelihood at that point. He, the man in the back is doing what's called the halu, which has been recorded that Indians did that before they came into their village to alert their village they were coming in with captives. Now the neat thing about that is that's Mike Copeland in the back and his son Anthony in the front, and Matthew Govan is the boy, and Mike's wife, is the Lisa is the, the lady and it was done out at Bledsoe Creek was where we took my canoe out there and set up the photo shoot and did it out there. Okay now Gateway to the West that was mentioned a little bit earlier this is one of my signature paintings that I've done is a rather large 48 inches 
But 2000, I was commissioned to redo this painting here. Now this is an iconic American painting that everybody knows, which is Daniel Boone coming through the Cumberland Gap. But for since the uh, Cumberland Gap National Park had identified the problems with this particular painting historically, as far as historical accuracy shows up, and they wanted another painting done that they felt would be more, more historically correct, and I was commissioned to do it. George Caleb Bingham did this painting in 1852, I believe it was, and it shows Daniel Boone, Rebecca on the horse, and other people coming along behind them, you know, through the Cumberland Gap. There's a lot of significant parts of this painting that's been interpreted to mean various things. And I can hit it real quick to you. The, she's on a horse. She looks like a Madonna with the uh, hood, the, the covering on her head. Right down there in the front, believe it or not, is a little stick sticking up on the lower right and a cross stick coming up. Well, that represents the cross. Now, this is what art people with a whole lot more educated in art than me has interpreted this painting to be. The light coming out behind the cliff on the left is the new light. The darkness on the left with the clouds are coming out of the darkness into the light. They're coming into Kentucky. And there's a lot more that goes on with that, which I'm not going to get into. But the problem with it is that there's a lot of significant inaccuracies in the painting that needed to be corrected, and I set out to try to do that. Now, this is my painting of the same painting that you saw. Now, they're coming up over the saddle in the Cumberland Gap, and I'm going to show you why that, well, I'll hit on a few things. The clothing that I have in my painting is, based on my research, is a little more accurate than what Bingham had on his. He's got some seven, he's got some 18, 20s, and 30s clothing on some of those men, but I tried to do it research-wise, tried to do it better. Now here's the big thing though. Here's the difference in the terrain, the landscape. You see those cliffs on both sides? Now Bingham lived in New York. Very likely there's no record he ever came to the Cumberland Gap to do research on this particular painting. That's the painting at the top. They're coming into Kentucky, out of now Tennessee, North Carolina then. The, paint, the photograph on the left is the Cumberland Gap looking at that same <coughs> saddle during the Civil War when they had cut all the trees off of those hillsides to feed a furnace, a lay, uh, iron furnace they had which is out of the photograph. And you can see the, the uh, gradual slope coming down to the saddle there. The photograph on the right is from the Tennessee side looking the other way and that white streak cut across it is the old highway that went across it. Now anywhere in there at all do you see these massive cliffs on both sides? Plus, the direction he's got them coming is the sun's in the wrong place too. But in 2000, before 2000, they built a tunnel through the mountain and rerouted the traffic through that tunnel. Then they took, in 2000, they took that highway you see right there completely out and filled it back to its natural slope and then put planted trees and grass on it and took the old wilderness road that Daniel Boone supposedly went, which there was remnants of it still there. I walked it. I, when I went over there to start this project, they assigned me a ranger, a park ranger who knew all about that. And she, she took me all over that whole area in there and showed me where the original wilderness road was still in existence. And now if you go back over there, there is a trail that goes over the Cumberland Gap like this that is the original wilderness road. Now then, here's some photographs I made when they were tearing out the highway. This old highway had been in there for, oh, late 18, well, way, way before that. I'd been over in the 50s, but they were taking it completely out. And one thing I did learn or thought I saw when I turned around, of course it's fall of the year, was I could look out there and see Tennessee in that light blue at the top. And when you when I did my painting, you can see it's right up there above them, above that big slash of light going across. I wanted to depict the depth of what was in there rather than just closing them in with trees all the way around. And there's the, the mural that uh, was spoken about when they were installing it then. Okay, then 
I also do Civil War paintings, and as I mentioned earlier, this painting was done in 1963, shows the, the Battle of Franklin. But uh, I, when I came back from the Army, I didn't do any more Civil War paintings until 1990, and my publisher kept wanting me to do Civil War paintings. I, I enjoy them, I really did, I still do. So uh, the first one I did was Robert E. Lee and this is one of them. I'm not doing battle scenes, I'm doing what I call field portraits of various people. And uh, this one, Robert E. Lee, Larry Mays modeled for me. He's local, he's not here tonight, but he lives down in Hendersonville. And he was my Robert E. Lee. And that's Stonewall Jackson in the valley. And that's Blake uh, Stewart on the left, and Blake lives in Gallatin. He's a good model. He's modeled for me for a number of paintings. This is called The Veteran, and this is a, a contrast of the, the uh, young men who were, a lot of them were drummer boys as opposed to the veterans behind them and the size and relationship between him and them, and they were just as exposed most of the time to the battles as the actual soldiers were themselves. So I'm trying to show this contrast, you know, of that. Nathan Bedford Forrest, I'll say, is one of my favorite Civil War figures, great general. That's at the Battle of Shiloh. General Claiborne at the Battle of Franklin, he was killed there in 1864. And that's some old guy <laughs> there with a really good looking woman. But uh, there again, Jane and I do some Civil War reenacting. And that's a nice old daguerreotype that we had made of us one time. She looks a lot better than I do for some reason there. That's understandable, isn't it? But anyway, from there, I want to jump into the, the movie business and the uh, documentary business, the film business. So I'm referred to as a flat artist. I paint on a flat surface, and now I'm going from flat artist to three dimension. And this is rewarding to be able to work in three dimension and see what goes on there as opposed to always just looking at photographs and painting from them. And my first involvement was Last of the Mohicans. When I saw Wes Studi in Dances with Wolves, he was the best looking Indian I ever saw. I wanted to paint Wes Studi, my Indians, and then I learned he was going to be in Last of the Mohicans. And he was, Mogwa. So I got on the set and I became an extra, which is right above no, caterers are above us. <laughs> We're right down there at the bottom of the heap, but I was on the set and I met Wes Studi, by golly. That's him. And I got say, that's in Ford, Fort William. Uh, but, uh, always on the set, he stayed in character, and he was a mean looking so and so. Never came out of character the whole time I ever worked with him. You should almost be scared of him right there. Some days I was a British soldier, and some days I was a French soldier, whatever they. Wanted me to do that day, I did. So that's Wes there, a photograph I made of him on set. This is my first painting I did of him, of him as a Shawnee. It's a close up of his head. Got a great, great features. There's another one of him as a Huron. There he is as an Illini, Indian. And there he is as a Pawnee. The last time I talked to Wes, I said, why don't we do you as a Cherokee? That's what you really are. He said, that'd be a good idea. You know, we might want to do that. But I never ever got around to doing it yet. So he and uh, Maura and Colin have come to visit us a couple times, and that's Bob Studi, his, his brother, who lives down in Hendersonville. And they're nice people, they really are. He's a good actor, I like him. I like both of that. My first actual paying job that I had in the film industry was called The Pride and the Promise, and that was a local produced documentary about the settlement of Nashville. I got one photograph of that, and that's Jane and me, and that I propped that whole film by myself, which I'll never do again, but uh, it was another learning experience. And then a fellow I met on Mohicans, Gary Foreman, who owns and started and owns uh, Native Sun Productions, called and said I need an art director for some of my documentaries and the first one that I was hired to do even though I had worked on some with him on the Battle of Kings Mountain and some other was Daniel Boone and the Western Movement and uh, it was done this one was done for the Cumberland Gap National Park too it's uh, about a 25 minute film and uh, it uh, is shown in the visitor center these are just some outtakes from that film 
Michael A.G. is one of my longtime models, and that's Mike down there in the front, kneeled down. He worked on this. He worked on Kings Mountain, too, didn't you, Mike? Yes, sir. Yeah, and uh, Martin Station and a number of documentaries Mike's worked on, as well as The Patriot and other films, too. But these are just some shots out of that. Who shoots your photographs? Yeah. Someday I'm going to ask Mike what, what his problem was there. <laughs> 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 you definitely have a, an attitude in that photograph, don't you? The fellow on the right played Daniel Boone. That's Scott Moody. But and there's Mike Copeland again, sitting on the edge of a rock. Who shoots your photographs? Hmm? Who shoots your photographs? I do. Okay. Yeah. This is up in Kentucky, and we did this. This is where Daniel Boone supposedly went out on this rock and overlooked the bluegrass of Kentucky, and we went up there and filmed. And Mike and uh, Johnny Manier and. Uh, Mike Copeland, and uh, it was a neat place to look out over Kentucky there. We also had Indians. These are white guys dressed up as Indians, but they're really good. They do a great representation of Indians, painted, marked up, and some others even going a little bit farther beyond the, the usual Indian. But there's a shot of our cameraman looking down off one of those bluff rocks. And there's some Indians down there now. Okay, looking at that, and you say, well, by golly, what's all those buildings and houses down below them? What do they do? That can't be 1770s. Well, CGI, what we call computer graphics, and sort of takes care of all of that. And that all disappeared. So they were standing up there overlooking that group up there. And this, that was over back over Cumberland Gap. This is back up in Kentucky at the, the Rock. That's Gary Foreman on the right, the, the producer and director and the cameraman, James, on the left. Then we did the Wilderness Road, which is a story of Martin Station in West. This is Martin Station in Virginia, right about eight miles out of Cumberland Gap. And it's a good, one of the best recreated 18th century fort sites in the country. You got what I call a million dollar backdrop there with the Cumberland Mountains behind it. That's Aaron Ehlert on the far left there. Aaron's in the back here. He's done several of these films too. Modeled for me for a number of things as well. And well, Don Dickerson, I see some others there. Wayne, these are just some outtakes of some of the shots. I've got tons and tons of shots that I've made, you know, of these films. I can't show you all of them at all. But there's Mike and uh, uh, Trent, Park. Trent Park, who still is a ghost, so I guess, doesn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They worked on the film. I became a director for at least two hours. It was my only time to ever become a director. They were shooting a shot off to the right down the hill. The sun was going down. We were going to shoot this grave scene here. Gary came up and said, we can't stop. Go up there and set this scene up and direct it. <laughs> so I went from being an art director to a director, and then back to an art director. The pay didn't change, but I did do this scene, and I thought it was kind of neat. What they are doing there is, of course, burying people on the wilderness road. So it's a picnic. We also did battles in the fort, and these are some of the shots of the battles. It just shows you all the smoke and the uh, mayhem and the uh, stuff that went on during the shooting. We try to make these all as real as we can, and that's putting a lot of makeup, dirt, uh, put everything into place, action, and make it as real as we can. And being an art director on a small film is, is not nearly as exciting as it sounds because I was over wardrobe, makeup, set dressing, getting things here, getting things built there. Now on a big film like Mohican's $40 million in, which now would be probably $200 million, they had everybody doing every individual thing. Gary Foreman gets more out of his money than anybody I've ever worked with on film because he knows how to do it and, and make it pay. And we do. And uh, even to, you know, our dogs having something to say about the whole set, too. <laughs> but uh, up there on the top in the back of the smoke, looking over with his rifle, is Mike Copeland shooting. That's Aaron there with the white hair and Mike on the right. And Eric Wingo, yeah, Eric Wingo there on the left. Now this is Jason Gatliff just after he ran into one of the cameras. <laughs> Jason was, had been shot, so this is a good, good example of how the uh, 
special effects works. They were putting blood on him. And here's getting direction on how to die. <laughs> and there he is dying, starting out. And this is how it actually wound up looking in the film. You know, this is the shot that he comes on out of the picture there. They walk him off of there. He'd been shot defending the wall and they pull him out of there. Now we always try to make all of our guys look prettier. Mike Copeland, always the exception, you know. He can look dirty quicker and easier than anybody in his love. We love it for that purpose because it doesn't take us long to make him up. But he always looks rugged. He does. He has a way about him. It always works out good. That's the crew that was on that particular film. Don Dickerson, Aaron, Mike, Jason, Michael A. G. and oh boy. Yeah. Herman Sergeant. Yeah. Herman. Yeah. Sergeant. And after the shooting's over, everybody's taking a break. The dog, too. <laughs> Believe me, when you're shooting films, there's a whole lot of downtime while they're setting up the scene. So everybody is taking a break and getting a rest when they can, because when the shooting starts, it's boom, 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 until it's over with. As a puppy dog, it's at the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Hey, this is the first invasion of War 1812, and this is for the History Channel. Now, let me put this in place. Our budgets were normally $250,000 for a one-hour film. This was a special two-hour film, so we had a $500,000 budget. In the movie business, that's pocket change. Those people don't even mess with this sort of money. That's the reason why I say Gary Foreman could get more out of his money what he does, and PBS, who I work with, usually has million dollar budgets and way on up. But this one here, First Invasion War 1812, is the one that I got no nominated for an Emmy for, for art direction. It was a fun one to work on. We shot it at several different locations. But this little scene right here is the Battle of New Orleans. Well, by golly, it was not a very big battle, was it? You got about, oh, 70, 80 men there. With the modern invention of CGI, we'll call it that, they duplicate all of this over and over and over again. When you see a big battle scene today, it's probably done with something about like 100 people or 50 people. And they he photographs these moving through and then they take that digitally and they just double them, triple them, make them smaller. And then you had the whole battle in New Orleans going on behind him there. Unfortunately, I don't have any outtakes on that. Here again, as an art director on a small budget film, I have to do everything. So I'm fixing this guy's uniform. Now this is a neat thing here. What you're seeing right there is a black field. It's all there was out there behind these people. We had a couple lights on them, but that building was nowhere to be seen. That was all done in Texas and special CGI. Built that building by digitally and then burned it digitally. So if you were standing there like me and taking this picture, you'd see a black field back there. That's all there was. It was amazing, when I, and they pan all the way around that building up and down on it, and you can't tell it isn't really real. It's amazing what they can do with it. Here again, Mike Copeland was one of our stars, and Mike always gets into the best of everything. Here he is trying to beat up on a poor British soldier <laughs> with a rubber gun. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do this take twice because Mike was smiling the first time he did it. <laughs> and so was the British soldiers. <laughs> they were having a big time. I had the director says, stop, 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 cut, cut, cut. He goes over and talks to him and says, you're killing each other out here. You're not having a good time doing it. Look at the guy in the very front. He's smiling. <laughs> so you got to watch these guys because they're having a good time beating up on each other. And there again, there's the director and the horse. Uh, the director's on the left. <laughs> Both of them are having a good smile. We had, we had a lot of problems with that horse always smiling on set. <laughs> He's got his teeth open. <laughs> to smack his jaws, you know, to keep him from smiling. That's my 15 seconds of fame. I got to play General Sam Smith for a short disc while there at the Battle of Bladensburg. He was a hero of Battle of Bladensburg, by the way. So, well, wait a minute, we went somewhere way out of, there I am. They even had me a nice horse, too. I just as well to say this, even though it was supposed to be at the end of my presentation. I really feel this, and this is a quote I came up with some time ago, 
to deliver in these presentations because of the historical artist, I feel that it's my obligation to present to the future, present, present, future generation, paint the subject with as much historical accuracy as possible because the people that come in the future are going to look at my paintings and others too and if it's not accurate as I can make it or not accurate as it can be, then you've done a disservice to them because they're going to think it is. Now that being said, I can only paint with the knowledge I have today. I study, I've done the study for 40 years and continue, 50 years and continue to do it as far as long as I can. But tomorrow as I found out something's going to change that may change your whole basis of what you thought was set in stone today. In 1978 there was a war shirt in the Cody Museum, the Buffalo Bill Museum, it was their favorite, most prominent, preeminent war shirt dated 1803, that was in 78. Had I painted that shirt on a, a Ricora and dated it 1803, now this is pre-Lewis and Clark. So museums do not date Indian clothing unless they have a collection provenance on it. So I assume they did. I went back in 1985 and that was gone, the shirt was gone. And it was in another case dated Sioux, 1870. <laughs> this is one of the premier Indian Museums in the United States of America. I had an appointment with the curator to shoot some Indian clothing for something that I asked George Horse Capture, that I related that story to him and asked him and his answer was very to the point. I'm the curator now. <laughs> At the end of the discussion. <laughs> had I painted it in 1803, then what would I have done? Well, I would painted it within the knowledge that I have, depending upon their accuracy, but then it may still be an 1803 Ricora, but right now it's out there as an 1870 suit. So that's what I feel like I'm doing. And I've, you know, I know paintings that are pretty well revered to Gary the Cut. Andrew Jackson with a Colt Peacemaker pistol that wasn't even invented until 1870s at the Battle of New Orleans. So you go 1815 to 1870s and that's quite a jump. Now out of that whole thing, I was nominated for an Emmy for art direction. And when I got that notice, you know, Jane and I sat there and talked about this, about, well, are we going to go out there? No, we're not going to go out there. That's a bunch of bull. You're not going to win? No, so don't go. Anyway, 10 seconds later, he said, you dad, I'm right, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, really is a little guy out in Gallatin, Tennessee, gets nominated for an Emmy, which is a pretty big deal. This is what they call a primetime Emmy. They have two different levels of Emmy. So anyway, got nominated. And we wanted to take the whole thing in. We wanted the experience. And I'll tell you what, it was an experience. Just be glad you live in Gallatin. <laughs> we were tickled to death, by golly, when we got back home. That's another country out there. Hollywood is another country. So we went, and we walked the red carpet, and we did all the things that were done, the parties and so on, had a good time, enjoyed all of that. And I didn't win, but I was in the room. So that, that's as close as I got. And we had fun doing it, but I sure, we both were sure glad when we got back home. Now this is a PBS documentary on Andrew Jackson. As I mentioned to you before, History Channel's budgets are little. PBS budgets are big. So if you could get a PBS budget to produce something, you got a pretty good thing to go. So this was short for my part. I was filmed one day, and I actually got to be an artist in this film. And there I are. And I'm the artist that painted Andrew Jackson. Not actually, I didn't paint him, but I faked painting him for a day. Bottom story, of the, the final story of this is, they shot me for eight hours, photographed and filmed, filmed me eight hours, painting Andrew Jackson, who was sitting in a chair in front of me. But we had a G-clay made of Andrew Jackson painting, and that's what I was, quote, painting on. And they did everything in the world. I was really fascinated by how much stuff they put into all of this. They had that handmade uh, artist smock built, and it was uh, made. It was very uh, righteous. Uh, you know, you got a collar. The clothing was all good. Wardrobe did a good job, I thought, on the clothing, until the set director come up, and she said, we've got to put some paint on the front of you. And she got red, yellow, and blue, and put it on my shirt, my smock. you see that there? I don't paint in red, yellow, and blue, and neither does any other artist, unless it's Jake Pollock or somebody that paints modern art. 
I got filth all over my smock today, but it's milky colors. Red, yellow, and blue is not what artists have. I tried to convince her of that, but she didn't take that much, uh, that much to that. But they filmed me for eight hours. They built a track around me with a little train on it. Went all the way around me. They had a, a uh, plexiglass pallet made and got on the floor and filmed me from the bottom pan in that boat. And uh, Andrew Jackson fell asleep 32 times <laughs> while I was coming. Well, he's sitting in the chair doing nothing. You know? And they kept, wake up, Andrew, wake up. So the ultimate was my hand, a close-up of my hand was on camera for about seven seconds. And was <laughs> Apparently, I didn't do much to impress him. Okay, this is the fun part of my whole presentation, working with models. And these are the folks who make my job easier. As I said, I'm a studio painter. I paint slow. I have to have good reference to do my paintings. The better reference I have, the better paintings I do. And so, therefore, I hire models. Don't say a word over here, models. I do hire models. And paint. <laughs> I do have models, and quite a few of them are in this room today here to come to see this. My longest and first long-lasting model, of course, is my brother Don, who's here with us tonight. He was my model for everything I did just about early on, and that's him in 19, what, Don, 76, 77? No, 80, 82, that's when the World's Fair. This is the painting that came out of that modeling session, and this is titled The, the Mountaineer, and that wound up being the Fine Arts Pavilion poster. Now you'll notice Don doesn't have a beard. <laughs> and how many times have I painted you and added a beard to you? Quite a few times. One time I even took a beard off of you. <laughs> okay, I got it back now. It's not going. Oh, it stopped again. I need your help. Okay, bear with me here. There we go. There we go. All right, good. All right, now we're back on. It's good to have a technician here, you know. Okay, Don, there's Don in the Rocky Mountains, and that really looks like the Rocky Mountains out there behind him. Right? But ultimately, he became this. Yeah. American Rifleman. And Don did reenact. No, he didn't do reenacting. He did living history as well back in the 70s and 80s, along with all of us, so we all did it. These are just some... I've painted him so many times I can't show all the different ones, but he's modeled for me this numbers work here. Turkey Hunter. Okay, I'm going to move on into Civil War time period and my models, and this is Michael A.G. and Caleb A.G. I was asked to do a pencil drawing of a child granting his father coming home from the war. And Michael and Caleb were my models. And Caleb was an enthusiastic model. I tell you what, Mark Caleb, he's back here in the back right now. He said, Make Caleb, run like it's your daddy coming back and you haven't seen him. Well, the truth of it is that when Caleb, Michael went to Afghanistan and uh, served a length of time over there, so Caleb has this first-hand experience of welcoming him when he came back home. So there's the drawing. We're back to that one there, as I was saying, that uh, Jason and Aaron and Mike Copeland modeled for me for that. That's a fairly large painting, too. Uh, this is a Rico woman, and Jana got a model for this one. I don't have a picture of her as a model right now. Um, this is called Caught Off Guard, and uh, it's uh, somebody's in trouble. He's got one time for a shot there, and if he misses, he's done. He's toast. Jason Gatliff was part of my model for this one, and we, this was a parked model, wasn't it, Jason? Parked yeah. modeling job. Jason was the hands and the gun, <laughs> which he's been leg model, he's been a foot model, and he's been a model model for me, so he is a very versatile model. <laughs> Back to Mike Copeland again. This is another painting I did for the uh, Idle Shore and uh, my Birch Bark Canoe. And these are some sketches I did for it. And there's Mike actually out at Bledsoe Creek. He does white guy and he does Indian for me as well. He's, he can do either one and do it well. This is him again. This one's called uh, Tight Spot. This guy is obviously in a tight spot. Will he be seen and discovered by those Indians walking behind him? The interesting thing about this history of this painting is that tree, that oak tree, is right was right behind my studio and it was that big. It was a magnificent 
tree. Jane and I loved it to death, and the tornado took it out in 2006. So there's a close-up of Mike. Now, when, I, when we did this painting, there was going to be a dog in this painting right there with Mike, by golly. He was going to be sitting there kind of huddled up next to Mike. So I had to have a dog model. And so I went and got a mountain cur dog model who was more interested in doing anything but modeling. <laughs> So, just, just so I fired him and went and hired another dog. And this dog was squirrelier than the first dog. <laughs> so, Seems to be the lowest common denominator there. Right? So, so wound up being no dog in that painting, and that's the way the painting went on. Civil War painting here. This is called Old Jack, and this has got Michael Agee in it down there below the Confederate flag. Michael did. Civil War reenaction for how many years, Michael? Ever since you were three years old, I think, weren't you? Long time. He's a good Civil War reenactor and does everything first class. Good clothing, good modeling, knows, the, knows it inside and out. So he's a natural model for me, and he's modeled for me for several Civil War paintings. That's him right directly below the Confederate flag. We're back to the uh, gateway to the West, and my lovely wife modeled for me, and she's another model that kind of gets caught when I need a model and has done a lot of modeling for me. That's her whole leading the horse. And there she is in one of the photographs of actually doing the uh, leading the horse. She also is an Indian model too. And she becomes she becomes an Indian. And we're back to this one here. This has several local models in it right there. That's Aaron on the back there and uh, What's his name? Dave Dykema on the front. There's the painting of how it turned out. Mm -hmm. Golly, I don't. That's Michael. You, that's you in it, Mike, with the knife. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Fred Prouty. Golly, I don't remember who all was in that. There's several in there. That uh, that's you on the far left again. Maybe you're in there more than once. But there's several guys that's modeled for those particular paints. Mike Ag also can be an Indian. <laughs> That's one of, I did these two paintings based on that one uh, series of photographs. And Casey does too, by golly. That was at Rock Castle. Blake Stewart's a, a, the local fella here who's a good Civil War reenactor, does a great job, and he's modeled for me for a number of paintings. That's called The Forager. And also Matthew Govan, who's now in the Army and I believe he's in Germany, modeled for me before he joined the Army for quite a few several different paintings, and that's my dog Sally there. That's Matthew again. That's him and Sally. That's him again. Now this painting was done for the National Muzzle and Rifle Association as a fundraiser, and it's called The Spirit of America. And in this painting is uh, just loaded with local models for me there. Starting on the far left is my grandson, and then the blue coat is J.R. Robinson. On the horse is Beth Euler. The little girl is somebody else I don't know. Leading the horse is Jason. On the horse in the middle is Aaron. Um, the fellow behind him is from, where was he from, Ohio? Can't remember, but uh, Mike Copeland in the very front. Phil Allison uh, behind Mike and Jana Gatliff behind there. And my daughter's off somewhere back in there too. So there's a lot of people we know that's in that particular painting, but that's the way west coming out of uh, Powell's Valley. That's me on my studio with my dog. She's a model, model for me for numbers of paintings, quite a few, but unfortunately she passed away in 2013, so I lost her as well. And there's my statement one more time, but I'll wrap up with this, and that's, I still feel that I've made my mistakes, believe it or not, more than once. When I said the right and the wrong of painting, I've got a number of mistakes I've made throughout the year. Some of them I've pulled back and cleaned up, and some of them I can't do that, so I just have to live with it. But there we are, and that right there wraps it up. Models make my life so much easier than I could ever express. But if I didn't have good models and they know what they're doing, they have the best stuff to use, and it makes my life as a painter that much easier and that much better too. So I am indebted to them more than I can say.
Let's thank him one. Well, there is no average. That's a, that's a tough question, and the smart aleck answer is about 40 years research. <laughs> and there's a certain truth to that, you know, element of truth to that. Well, like, what's the longest it's ever taken? Three months, four months. Oh, my gosh, like are that. you kidding? No. <laughs> but the reason I say there's no set answer to that is what's involved in the painting, how involved. The painting with all the guys and the girls in it, with all the horses in it, took a while. We did photo sessions, multiple photo sessions on that. Got horses, rounded up in here, brought them in. Uh, Aaron loved his horse really well, didn't you, Aaron? <laughs> but anyway, you encounter all of the things. That, and, you know, some of the Civil War paintings that have a lot of figures in them are going to take a lot longer than, say, that sketch that I did of uh, Matthew and my dog. You know, you can do those in two, three, four, five hours, whatever. Are you, you know, kidding? Happening. Oh, but, my gosh. But, but when, you, when you're out, uh, out west on a horseback, are you wearing clothes, no kidding, like period clothes? Mm -hmm. Or do you have like like down <laughs> lining no. and stuff? No, that's the, I belong to the American Mountain Men Association and that's their purpose is to recreate that time period as best we can and that means everything that we use, wear, eat, and on that trail is 1820s, 1840s time period. Our guns are all flint locks or percussions in some case. When we do, and all of these guys does the same thing here, frontier, long hunter period, we do the same thing here. We'll go over in East Tennessee, go to the wilderness areas, get away from you know, the, the public and get away from uh, any type of, I uh, want to say, <laughs> amenities, let's put it yeah. that way. I've done that, did that nine day wilderness trek, you know, and didn't have any food and found out on that, great learning experience. If any of you want to go out and live off the land for nine days, which you're not going to die, that's obvious. But what we found out was we had gone over and scouted that land in the spring. Well, in the fall, there ain't no water there. Somewhere, somewhere the water went away where it was there in the spring. So we had to climb 300 feet into the gorge just to get water after the first day we went down in the gorge came out. And also, the only thing we ate was snakes and uh, squirrels and berries and frogs and stuff like that and you find out your carbohydrate intake and all of those things which I knew nothing about back in the 80s does not get much from squirrels you can, you can die eating squirrels and squirrels without salt pretty damn tasty yeah, he would tell you this that I was with and watch out yeah. I went in the army during the Cuban crisis. When I came out, I wasn't out but a short period of time that he wasn't armed. He went to Vietnam. And what he never tells anybody is that in Vietnam he was shot. He went to the tent to get taken care of, but there was a lot of wounded guys there that was worse shape than him, he said. He went back to the line and went back to war and shot. But he never tells anybody the story. <laughs> I wasn't shot. You got that wrong. I did go to the hospital the day they bombed the U.S. Embassy, and you got bodies everywhere. And I had cut my hand open pretty bad. And I turned around and left. I was, they didn't need me there, but anyway, I wasn't shot. <laughs> Every round I went by, man, I heard them by golly. But anyway, but anyway back to talking about art. David, no, do right. you have a favorite painting or one that's that's you've been uh, most privileged to paint or just your favorite? Well, the, the most well-known painting is the Cumberland Gap painting, that's obviously, for all the exposure that it's got through the years. The one that I set out to do and accomplish the closest at the end is the captain. You'd be surprised as an artist, and I don't know if other artists, if we all sit down and really got honest with each other, is what I have in my mind, and I do all my sketches, and I work all of these out beforehand. And somewhere along the line, things shift, color shift, whatever, and they come out a little different. Sometimes they come out better, sometimes they come out with, I'm just not satisfied as I thought it would be. That painting wound up looking like what I had envisioned to begin with on it, and I was really pleased with that. A lot of others haven't. And as I said, I made my mistakes uh, back earlier on, more so than today, because I really try to research more. Well, I, I always research, so, but I try to make sure that my work is as 
pure as it can be as far as the authenticity. I broke this, Jane and I just had 30 collectors, artists and collectors at our house from the Booth Western Art Museum two, three, three weeks ago. And I asked this question of them. What's more important to you, a good painting or an accurate painting, historically accurate painting? What do you think they said? Mm -hmm. There was no answer. One felt only one person would answer. And obviously the, the answer would be a good historically accurate painting, right? And he said, I'm no historian. I have to rely on you to have it done. Probably everybody in the room probably felt the same way. Well, that's what I try to do. If they depend upon me to try to make it correct, starkly accurate, then I want to do that. I feel like, like I said, that's my obligation to do that. And I try hard, but I can only do it within the perimeters of what I've learned to that day. And believe me, like I recounted with that war shirt, uh, that's a museum. And that's one of the best Indian museums in the United States, saying that shirt in 1978 was this, and then seven years later, when another curator comes on, it's something entirely different. Wow. So that's the danger you run into. We gather our information from the written word, primarily documents that were written, primary source documents written by the people who took part. Secondary source documents are by people who knew them or heard the answer. And in the case of Civil War paintings, there's so much in evidence today in artifacts and <clears throat> accoutrements and farms and everything still in existence. It's not in existence for 1770s and 60s and the 1820s and so on. That they got a lot more to pull from. And believe me, Civil War enthusiasts will cut you up and throw you out the door if you got a backpack or a pack on one that wasn't made till three months after the battle, you know, and they know it too. Uh, got a little more leeway with 1770s clothing, but primary source documents, paintings, and then ask yourself, same thing I'm doing, how accurate is that artist who did that painting in 1770? Benjamin West, he still got his props that he, claimed, he accumulated from Indians that he got in his paintings, they're still in existence today. But then you can look at some Benjamin West paintings and say, this is not right, and that's not right, and so on. So you don't know exactly what to do. So you've got to trundle through all of that, and sift out what you think's right, and throw out what you think's wrong. Our big favorite artist of the fur trade is Alfred Jacob Miller, who was the only artist ever go to a rendezvous in 1837. He was hired by Sir William Drummond Stewart to be his artist, who was a Scotsman, rich Scotsman. He went to rendezvous, and Miller went with him and documented his field sketches and so on, and then went back and then painted paintings back home after he got back. That is first person on the ground. Catlin, Rainey, Tate, all of those came later. Well, Catlin was out there, but he didn't go to any rendezvous. So you can try to take all of these things and put them together and say, this one looks like that one and this one. Some of Miller's stuff to us right now, it's right on the money and some of it's artist license. You know, he's doing stuff, he's making it this and that. So you gotta sift through that and say what's right, what's not right, and then try to use it as reference. It's a tough job sometimes and I'm gonna obviously make mistakes. That painting I had, which I said was my first full color painting, A Way of Life, I immediately got a letter telling me what I did wrong. <laughs> Unsigned, unfortunately. Then I did another painting, well, oh, six or eight years later, and I got another letter with 10 points that I did wrong. And here's what you did wrong. And boy, you had a number all the way. Unsigned. <laughs> and, uh, and out of those 10 points, I could probably take eight of them and say, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Indians always wore the powder horns on the left. Tell me that. The Indians never wore a capote with a hood on it. I've got documentation that they were making capotes for Indians or hoods back in the 1600s, you know, because it was a cottage industry. So on like things like that. So you take all of that, put it in the right perspective and think, well, what is he right here? Maybe, maybe, maybe. And then you just roll, it rolls off of me like water. But most of the time I get very little of that. I really do. But there are some artists out there, even I will critique and say, boy, you ought to, you ought to pay attention. <laughs> like one, I said, where do you get your references? Even movies? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> movies is your reference for doing historical painting? David, need, I have to ask We you, need to talk. <laughs> I have to ask you, uh, do you see the movie play in your head? Uh, and, and do you become a, a personal friend to your subjects? Uh, having read and done all this historical research, 
Because when I did the documentary on the Cumberland, I, I found myself becoming friends with Tom Ryman, although I never knew him. Do you find yourself attaching to your subjects, and, and how do you, when you're done with a painting, move to the next painting without remembering the friendship, or do you carry that forward? You know, you got a good point there, because I do read about, especially Civil War figures that I paint, Lee, Jackson, Longstreet, Cleburne. I do two types of, res res uh, two types of research on them. I read a modern biography where somebody has stepped way away from the subject, didn't know him anything. He's getting all of his material from a lot of different sources. But I also read those books that were written by either a biography at the time, a lot of times by the men that served with him. And you know those books are always going to be self-serving. But that's where all the fun stuff is, because they're telling you stuff that they did. And they had Daniel Boone's life when Lyman Draper was writing it in 1840s. It's got things in there just make you die laughing. He and his brother, Squire Boone, stole out one night to go to town and saddled up the horse and took off to town against their father's wishes. They were supposed to be in bed asleep. As they went down the road, they stepped up on a cow who raised up, tripped the horse, which fell over the cow and broke its neck. Oh. And there they are with the dead horse in the road figured out. So they very quietly took the saddle back, put it back in the barn, went back to bed. And the next morning, the cow was gone. And here's this dead horse laying right there. <laughs> so his father never did figure it out. <laughs> but you, won't, you won't find that story in biographies today because that's not Daniel Boone fighting Indians and all of those things there. But that's the human side of all of this history. There's lots of this that go there. Read the Lipscomb journals. Guys that came to North Carolina, the National in 1780, you'll laugh your hand off at those guys. They knew nothing about frontier living, and what they were counting. They were eating dead chickens, and they had been dead for days, you know, when they'd hit a, they'd hit a homestead, they didn't know how to hunt. They'd eat anything somebody gave them, and one day it was, dead, it was chickens had been what they called high, and you can figure out what that is and loved it because they hadn't eaten in days. They had, and said, there's a river full of fish, they could see them and they couldn't catch them. Things like that. Now that just doesn't fit somebody coming to North Carolina to Nashville, Tennessee to claim their land grants, you know, afterwards. But they're real people. You know, there's a lot of good documentation out there that's a lot of fun to read. It's not just dry, dry history all the time. But yeah, when I read about somebody, else, I've got my favorites, definitely do. And then there's others that I've, don't particularly like, but still can paint. But yeah, it goes on. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Did you do one called simply the Long Hunter? Hmm? Did you do one simply called the Long Hunter? Yes, I did. That was in Nathan Harsh's office. Probably was in 1976 or seven. It's Don was my model for that one too. Beautifully, beautifully. Now that's one of them that's got mistakes in it. Oh. You need to get that one take it away. <laughs> <laughs> when I started painting full-time, I phased out my commercial work in 1978 and went painting fine art fully, and partly because Greystone Press had started in 73 and I was gaining and getting some acclaim there and some income too, but also I had gone with the gallery in Dallas, Texas, Alterman Gallery, which had a great clientele in the West where the big money was. And I, I mentioned earlier, Nashville is not a good art market for historical realist painting, painters. For instance, I can't remember what year, of 78, I had a painting I had in a gallery in Nashville for $1,100 for years. And when I went with Alterman, he had his first auction, I sold a cow, a horse, and a painting, a cow, a horse, and a painting. It brought $4,000, and I thought, I've got on to something here. I need to pay attention to being out there instead of paying for the Nashville market, and that's where it took off. And then the other great thing was the Booth Western Art Museum, when they opened and had my painting in there, as well as buying some more paintings later, you know. That's another good, and your, your career, your building and everything, those things are kind of important. The Idle George Museum Show, one of the best museums in the country, I got into that show, and that was another forward making step. I'm with the Legacy Gallery in Scottsdale and Jackson and Bozeman, Montana, one of the best galleries in the country. And when they called around 2000, when was it, Jane, 2006 or seven, and I went with them, that was another good step forward in my career, too. So I'm pretty much where I'd like to be 
at this point. Uh, we would like to have more time to go do other things, but it seems like we've got more demand on time now than we had 20 years ago. But can't complain about that. I'm still hitting for the fence, but I'm not necessarily hitting as high as I used to. So that that drawing, I made mistakes in that, done in 1976 or 77, when Don, Don modeled for me, and he wasn't a mistake, I was a mistake of what I put in. And I learned that lesson later in 1991, we pulled that print off the market and replaced it with the long knife, which he modeled for, which is, and I can back this up pretty well and feel comfortable, is a historically accurate rendering of the same person. You know, the, the biggest thing that I didn't know in 77, 78, was the rifle he is carrying. He's a 1770s character. It was an 1820s rifle. Documented, found out later on, built in East Tennessee by Alfred Duncan. So I was only 30 years, 40 years too late. That. So certain reason why we took it off the market and put a good 1770s, 1780s rifle back in the Well, he got my attention and I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you liked it. It's gone, but uh, the long knife, you know, it was an unlimited print. They still sell those, too. Grace known to us. David. Mm -hmm. I, I was expecting to see the blue belt. Well, I had so many. I, I was afraid that the lights would come on and everybody would be asleep. And uh, so I didn't bring a lot of them, Bill. Oh, okay. That's a good story. Bill and I have talked about That's a Lewis and Clark story. I did show that one at Mariah's River because that was such a historical event for them. The Blue Belt was a very personal, uh, involved story with uh, that. I did a painting called Blue Belt, which is, you know, Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea and all of the others that were on there. They took beads with them out west to trade and sell and give to the Indians for various purposes. And they took blue beads and white beads and other colors too. Well, the Indians liked the blue beads the best and they ran out of them. So early on in the trip, they gave Sacagawea a number of blue belt beads and she made a belt. And this is recorded. She made a belt for herself out of that. When they got to the West Coast and they were wintering out there at Fort Clatsop, William Clark wanted a sea otter robe from the Klamath Indians for his fiance to take home. And there's nothing they had left, because most everything was gone, that those Indians wanted that they would trade him for the sea otter rope, except that blue belt that she was wearing. And she gave it to him for the sea otter robe to give to Clark. And he took that back to his fiance. Yeah, so I did a painting of her showing him that belt on the upper Missouri River, you know, someplace up there back in the 80s, a long time ago. Another local model on that one? Yeah, that was Andy Ward, was uh, William Clark, and Onawaki Clinch, who I showed you up there in the, as a Cherokee. She was the uh, Sacagawea, Sacagawea. That's changed too, by golly. I painted them and spelled them with a J, and now it's with a G, and it's pronounced Sacagawea, not Sacagawea. For all of y'all have been calling her Sacagawea all your life, it's now Sacagawea. Things change for research. Oh, who was your model for Hugh Rogan? I didn't. I painted Hugh Rogan. Out on the Bledsoe Creek. Huh? At the historical in fort. The park. At the, it's at the historical fort area along the interpretive. I'm almost positive oh, I thought that it said. Did you, did, the the you designers did claimed that that was Hugh Rogan. They used a number of my paintings okay. on the, the uh, wayside did. signs out there. Is okay. one of them for Hugh Rogan? Yes, sir. I don't know. Did you model for that? Which one of y'all model that was, for that? I think it was Oliver. It was Oliver. Oliver. Was that the one yeah. you called it? Yeah, Oliver yeah. McCloskey. He's out in Utah. Great model. He's, he's been a good model for me. I've got models all over the United okay. States that I always pull the best of the best. Guys that know what they're doing. They've got the clothing that's right. Usually it's worn because they do it. It's not something they wind up being brand new. And so that just think what that takes off my back to have to go out here and buy a rent and an outfit or prop, as we call it, people. Uh, you know, there sits a human machine over there in the back corner that can make anything <laughs> overnight that you need and make it well. And he does. He makes everything, and he's made a lot of props, if you want to call it that. But they're not just props because he wears them, we sell them, you know, and he sells them and makes that. But all of us have. We make our own clothing. 
and uh, it makes it look better for me. Does it make it look better for y'all? Does is what I've shown you of my work look righteous or not? You know, that's the question. Do you feel comfortable knowing that my historical accuracy is right, such as Bob Hunter asked me, and you know, I'm not a historian. I have to rely on you as the artist to make it right, you know, in that case. But the answer to that whole question is, without it being a good painting, it'll never go anywhere. It can be a good painting in a sense of composition, color, all of the things that go into a good painting. If the historical accuracy is wrong, at some point it's going to fail down the line from that standpoint. And that standpoint shows up over and over. Just like the George Caleb Vega painting, done in 1852, and they're down in 2000, 2000, 148 years later, the Park Service determines they need another painting rather than that one because it's just not historically accurate. Also, another nice little note about that painting was he painted that painting, sent it to Europe to have prints made of it or engravings, and he came back and never could sell it. So he repainted it. That's not the first painting that he did that you see. And the reason they know that is the engravings that were done in Germany show a different painting. So they took that original painting and x-rayed it and found the overpaint underneath it. And what he had there where people were going away from you, in the background they were going across Right, like, like there was a bridge across there, which was really a bit weird. <laughs> There's no bridge out there. Those mountains go like this, not like that. There's bluffs over there. You'll see bluffs, but not like that. So his painting didn't sell. He repainted it, and apparently it did sell. And today it's one of the greatest iconic paintings of American art. It should be, you know, at the time period. Whatever happened to that cure? curator of that museum that was inaccurate. I'm sure you're not the only one that figured out that that thing was two different time periods, two different tribes. I Whatever mean, happened to him, he was an Indian, first of all. He was a, a, a Blackfoot blood Indian, we call him blood Indian. Um, and he was a very politically motivated Indian at the time, and he didn't stay. He stayed several years, but he's gone. And George Horse Capture, apparently very well thought of in, in, in uh, museum circles, and probably is, I'm sure he's a pretty, pretty knowledgeable person. Whatever made him think that was it, because boy, it was, to me, when I studied, looked at that, and looked at Bodmer's paintings, and, and Catlin's paintings, and even A.J. Miller and the others that painted out there in the 30s, in the 30s, this is 30 years after, almost, than that, when they documented that, that shirt looked to be early 1800s by the beadwork and the, the techniques and the style of Indian shirts evolve over a period. You can you can not date them by the year, but you can say this is early and that's late. And most museums will do that. This is early and that's late. They don't want to get into a, a pen match about whether this is 1832 or 1804 or 1870. So it surprised me when I saw it go from 1804 to 1870 in a group with a bunch of other Indian uh, outfits in it, because it looked early to me, but I'm not a curator of a well-known Indian museum either, but I would have painted it to be that early time period if I'd known. You did uh, several of Don's books too, also. I did the cover for all four of his books, you know, the cover, uh-huh, yeah. By the way, right over there on the end is Bill Bradford. Countryside Studios is who prints our G Clay. Greystone Press had a fire uh, eight or nine years ago and lost everything. So at that point, we quit doing paper prints, what we call paper prints, which are the early ones we did in the 70s, 80s, and we did G Clays, which is printing on canvas which are much better reproduction. Looks like the painting. You don't have to frame it under glass. The, uh, Method is, uh, doesn't have a four color dot, right Bill? And right here in our town, Ralph McDonald's Countryside Studio, Bill takes care of all my work. They do my G clays for me and do a great job, as well as print a lot of other people's work too. It's Ralph's and other people's work too. So that's a, a neat thing. I don't have to go with four or five miles to check my work, you know, when they print it for corrections and such as that, and then they take care of the whole thing. So that's really worked out well for us. Is the printing done here in Nashville? Printing done here in Gallatin, right, right over there. Right. 
Yeah, right over here off the square. G clay means French to spread the ink, I believe is what it means. So there's no four color dot anymore. That's old letter press offset printing is what they used to do. So you get a better reproduction all the way around. Thank you so much. Well, thank you.